Okay, so I have a lot to talk about. We're starting a little late, so I'm going to dive right in um, and just get going here. Uh, I want to begin by asking you a question uh, that I want you to kind of keep in mind as we move along here uh, in this talk, and that is, who are the most dangerous people in the world? Now, you might have somebody in mind already, right? I mean, some people would say Donald Trump, maybe, or some people might say uh, Vladimir Putin, or Kim Jong-un, or Elijah Toller, or the folks at the Bilderberg Group, or whatever. Um, but I want you to treat it as an open question, something that you're kind of looking for the answer to. Um, and I want to ask you another question also, just to, before we really get into it, and that is, what's your favorite part of the story? Do you like the beginning, you know, when they're just introducing the characters and you're kind of finding out what the central conflict is going to be? Or do you prefer the middle of the story where, you know, things start to, you know, the structure of the story reveals itself and there's the things happen, you know, you get the first chasing and so on. Or do you really prefer the end of the story when all the plot elements come together, the conflict gets resolved finally, you know, and that's, that's sort of it. What do you think? You know, it, it, might, it might depend on what kind of story it is, right? I mean, if it's Shakespeare, you've got to ask what mood was he in. Was it a tragedy that day, or was it a comedy, right? That might make some kind of a difference. Or maybe, maybe if it was an epic, uh, you know, there's lots of stories so over and over and over. Um, the reason I ask this is because it's, it's stories that matter most to us. As an educator, I know that if I explain something with facts and with logic, my audience will nod and smile and shrug their shoulders. But if I tell a story, then they'll understand it. If I make them part of the story, they'll remember it. And more than that, if I make them part of the story, they'll become committed to it. So, you know, there's really nothing any of us learns to know more urgently than our own story. Every single one of us is the main character in our story, and we want to know what kind of story it is. That's pretty important. Tragedy, farce, right? Is it a short story? Okay, so keep that in mind. I'm going to tell you a story. It's a short story. That's it. <laughs> um, okay, there's, there's a little more to it than that. Uh, I, you know, as, as Ryan mentioned, I teach math, uh, college math as a hobby. And um, one of the lectures that I give uh, has this as the title, it's the, in the general education, uh, you know, math because you have to, of course. Um, and the point of the class, uh, the point of the lecture is to teach the mathematics of natural growth. You know, how, by natural growth, I mean anytime you have something growing and the amount of new whatever it is, is proportional to the amount that's already there. Or, or to put it more simply, if you express growth as a percentage per unit time, that's natural growth. Um, and one of the most important features of natural growth is that the doubling time, say it's a population, the doubling time is always constant. Um, regardless of the size of the population, the, the amount of time it takes for it to double is always the same. It's kind of easy to visualize if you think of bacteria, because how do bacteria um, grow, right? They, they sort of get a little bit bigger and then they split into two. And then after a little bit while, uh, while, a little while longer, those split into two, and then those split into two, and so on. So that, that doubling time. And to help students get a sense of it, here's a question that I commonly ask. Suppose you put some bacteria in a beaker that's got some nutrient in it so it can grow. And suppose this bacteria is going to grow, um, say it doubles every minute, you know, the little doubling thing going on, say it doubles every minute, okay? And it's going to grow just fast enough so that at the end of an hour, it just fills the beaker, right? And after that, it'll start to kind of slip over the side. So here's the question that I ask students. How full is that beaker after 59 minutes? Half full. Yeah, it's half full, right? This I was playing spot the nerd. Got it. Um, <laughs> why? Sure. Because it doubles every minute, right? And in the last minute, it has to double. So it evidently, it doubles from being half full to completely full. Okay. So, bunnies are the example I use in my lecture, and it goes like this. So, it's bunnies in the meadow. Uh, we'll need a meadow. There we go. That's a nice meadow. Um, Where is it? Where is it? That is actually in Santa Barbara. Really? Yeah. I got it off Google, but that's what it said. That's crazy. It's beautiful. Um, so, one thing we know about any meadow is that there's no such thing as an infinite meadow. All meadows are finite in size, so there's some limited number of bunnies that it could, it could contain sustainably year over year. So let's, for purposes of illustration, let's suppose 
that we can have a thousand bunnies in this meadow. Sustainably, that is, it produces enough food and enough water and it has enough space so that year over year a thousand bunnies could live there. All right, and we're going to start with some amount of bunnies, so let's start, we want some genetic diversity. Let's start with 10 breeding pairs, okay? So we've got 20 bunnies to start with. And then we ask, what's the doubling time for bunnies? Anybody here ever had bunnies? No, I didn't when I was a kid. So they're pretty um, fecund, aren't they? And they, they reproduce pretty quickly. The doubling time in nature for a population of bunnies turns out to be about one season. So there we go. They've got initial bunnies, our maximum bunnies, our doubling time. Let's see what takes place here. So remember, this is a you know, math lecture, so there's like graphs and stuff. Um, <laughs> right, so there's the bunnies on the vertical axis, and then the season's going along the horizontal axis, and we're starting with 20, and in the first season, those 20 double to 40. As you expect. And then in the next season, we double from 40 to 80, and in the third season, we double from 80 to 160. And at the end of the first year, there are 320 bunnies. And everything is going great, right? Because there's still lots of space, there's plenty of food, more than anybody can eat, lots of fresh water. And so now, you can pretend you're my students, right? The question is, how many bunnies at the end of the second year? Go ahead, I'll wait. So, you said, so let's see, so it's a 320, so it's a 640, right? So how many at the end of the second year? 20, 25, so, right, so, see, the act, yeah, it's, it's, it's if, if it were an infinite meadow, but it isn't, right? So what actually happens? So in the first season of the second year, they double again to 640. And in the, the second season of the second year, they double again to 1,280, and now there's too many bunnies. And what you hope will happen, I mean, the, the nice end to this story, is that the old and the sick will not get any food, and the other thousand will just kind of eat what keeps coming, right? And then that's how it'll stop a lot of thousand bunnies. Is that what happens? No. That's Zombie not bunny purge. <laughs> <laughs> what? Zombie bunny purge. <laughs> yeah. So what actually happens is, you know, the, the bunnies are like us. They like the tender young stuff, right? So there, there's too many bunnies. They're eating up all the little buds that come up off the plants, all the fresh young leaves. When that happens, the plants aren't growing anymore because that's how plants grow. They produce new growth. They have to have buds that have an opportunity to make leaves and to make new plant. Well, now they can't do that anymore. So as the bunnies are increasing their numbers, the food supply is actually kind of cut off. And so they start eating the old leaves. And when they do that, the plants die. So now there's no living plants even that could make food. And so they start eating the stems down to the ground. And when the stems are gone, they dig up the roots and they eat those. And then eventually they start to eat each other. The animals will do that, you know. So the end of this story is that the last bunny dies from famine in a barren wasteland. Now that's a horrifying outcome to the story. And fortunately, it almost never happens. I won't say it never happens. It almost never why? Well, because there are externalities to the bunnies. There's more going on here than just bunnies. When nature was busy designing bunnies, it was also busy designing coyotes. Right? And when there get to be lots of bunnies, what do the coyotes do? They party like it's 1999. Right? All of a sudden, it's bunny feast time. And there get to be more coyotes, and they eat too many bunnies, and then they go hungry, and then back and forth. And in the real world, populations of things like bunnies and coyotes vary quite a lot from year to year. But over time, they remain in rough balance. Okay, I can't help myself observing that there's a kind of a popular idea at the moment that the world would be a better place, at least for the bunnies, if the coyotes were all learning veggie burgers. <laughs> but clearly it's a little more nuanced than that, right? Okay, so our purpose here isn't to learn mathematics, so we want to focus on the moral of this story, and the moral of this story is, of course, something to do with us. We are like the bunnies in many ways, uh, in particular, we live on a finite meadow. We call it the Earth. And we have, over the course of two million years or so of our species being around, had to deal with a whole lot of externalities that caused famines and plagues and other things that held our numbers in check. But the way that we're crucially different from bunnies is we don't just pass on our genes to each generation. We also pass on knowledge. And most of the knowledge that we pass on 
is knowledge about how to get around the externalities. So long ago, we figured out how to not have to follow our food all over the countryside. Instead, we got our food to come and live with us. It's called domestication. And instead of having to rely upon chasing after this plant over here that is in season this time and then that one over there, we domesticated those too. And that allowed us to build settlements, and settlements allowed people to specialize, and knowledge began to increase, and then society got complex, and you know the story. And here we are at the early stages of the 21st century, and we've overcome all the externalities that we possibly could. We no longer have to rely on anything we've got. You know, mountains of food we can make out of the soil. We've conquered all the infectious diseases. You no longer have to expect half your children are going to die before the age of five. All of these things we've done. The only externality we haven't overcome is it's still a finite meadow. So let's talk about that. Well, like the bunnies, how big is this meadow? How many people will it hold? There's a lot of opinions about that. It covers a wide gamut, okay? A lot of people think, well, probably 10 billion might be close to the maximum, certainly sustainably. Um, some people think it's probably more like 3 or 4 billion, which is a little bit awkward because there's about twice that many of us now. Um, but we don't know. What we do know is you know, what we've had in the past, and to pick a starting point for our population, let's go back to the beginning, right before the industrial era really took off to about 1800. There were a billion of us. And the third question we have to answer is, what about our doubling time? Now, our doubling time has been slowing. It, it reached a peak speed in the 20th century when I was young. Um, the population has doubled approximately in my lifetime. It was actually down to 35 years was the doubling time. Century, but, love it. but now it's up to about 65 years. But still, 65 years is the doubling time at our current rate of growth. So what does the graph look like? There we are, people doubling time, 65 years. What does the graph look like? Well, it looks very familiar. It looks just like the bunnies, doesn't it? It's that familiar ski jump thing, right? And there we are, somewhere between 7 and 8 billion right now in 27, 2018. Um, and if you know this were the same lecture, I'd be saying, so how many bunnies are there going to be? How many people are there going to be when you all at my age, you've got to pretend I'm talking to kids who are 19, right? How many are there going to be? If you look at that graph, it looks exactly like the same story as the bunnies, doesn't it? It does. Exactly like. OK. So naturally, that leads to this question. When are we going to go into overshoot? Because we know what happens when we go into overshoot, right? The bunnies. We don't have any coyotes except each other. That works to an extent. But what's going to happen when we go into overshoot? Now, there is an organization, more than one, but one in particular that's dedicated to answering that question. It's called the Ecological Footprint Network. Um, and they put together all the science about how much of this we're using and how much of that we're using and how much can the Earth produce and so on. And they've got an answer to when we're going to go, go into overshoot. And it's approximately, uh, we're going to go into overshoot in about 1970. <laughs> so when I was a little boy, 1969, watching the, the moon landing on my great aunt Edith's color television, she was kind of wealthy. And she had a color television night with a clicker. It had a clicker. Um, that year, we used up about a year of what a year's worth of what the planet can produce, right about the end of December. By the time I was in high school, we were using it up within ten or eleven months. By the time I started teaching mathematics, we were using it up within nine or ten months, and that was actually kind of convenient because then I could time my, you know, my bunnies in the meadow die lecture with Earth Overshoot Day and kind of get a little extra emotional punch. You know, I, I can't do that anymore because in 2018, we're going to start using up more than the Earth can produce in a year after only about seven months. Somewhere around the first of August is when we're going to start, so to speak, eating our children. So that's, um, that's troubling, isn't it? And the question is, what, what is the consequence for our meadow? What impact are we having on our meadow now? And uh, I'm trained in the sciences. Um, you know, if I'm sitting in the audience listening to me talk, I'm saying, OK, yeah, sure, OK, you got a bunch of tree huggers who say we're destroying the Earth and all that. But really, show me some real data. 
So I went to the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. I said, how do you quantify our impact on the Earth? How to measure human impact? And they have a measure. It's called net primary production. Net primary production is actually the weight of carbon that our biosphere converts into organic matter in a given period of time. We'll talk about within a year. That's the, that's the magic of a biosphere. It takes energy from the sun and it pulls carbon out of the air and it pulls hydrogen out of water and nitrogen out of the air and the soil and it makes carbohydrates, which is the food that everything eats. It's what provides the fuel to the trophic web. Trophic web, that simply means everything eats everything else. It's the food web. So we would have two questions about that primary production. The first question is, how much of it are we using up now? I mean, there's only so much that the meadow can produce. How much of that are we using? And the second question we would want to answer is, how much have we impacted the net primary production of the planet? Is it changing because of us? So let's look at the second question first. This is a nice map. This, now, this is just above ground net primary production. A lot of it takes place in the oceans. Phytoplankton producing a tremendous amount of our oxygen and so on. But this is just the above ground change in net primary production. And if you look at this map, the yellow and the orange bits are where it has actually increased. You might say, oh wow, we've increased net primary production. Well, yeah, in all the agricultural areas of the world, we irrigate and we fertilize and we plant just those plants that produce the maximum amount of food. So in those regions, the net primary production of the planet has actually increased. In other areas where it's blue, it's gone down, and that's easy to understand. The blue areas are the built-up areas, right? When you build a road, that's no longer producing anything. When you put a house down, that piece of ground is no longer producing anything. So everywhere that there's human activity besides farming, we're reducing that primary production. So on balance, it has declined since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution by about 10%. And that decline is mostly in the last 40 years. And the rate of decline is accelerating. So then we ask, okay, so how much of net primary production are we using? On this map, the yellow and the orange places and the red places, that's where we're using the most. And you notice it's also the agricultural areas. In fact, in agricultural regions, we take 83%, which has got to be somewhere very close to the theoretical maximum. 83% of what the Earth produces in the agricultural regions of the world is just for us. It's taken out of the system and we use it. Um, Grazing land is not as high, it's only 19%. That's because a functioning pasture is still an ecosystem, so there's still a lot going on there that we're not eating. But um, still 19% grazing land, forestry areas, 7%. Overall, on average, we're using approximately 28% of above ground net primary production right now. Or I should say, this was in 2000. Um, I was trying to research, I was trying to find more current numbers, and it's difficult to do. There's a lot of research going on, but it's always localized. You know, what's the, what's the human appropriation in China? What's the human appropriation in, in Africa, and so on. So trying to get global numbers is very difficult. But I did find one paper that suggested that by 2050, they expected to increase somewhere between 15% and 35%. That's how much more uh, of net primary production humans will be taking out of the system. As informative as these graphs and numbers are, now so I've got to get away from the science because it's too abstract. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Randall Monroe. He writes the XKCD comic strip. Mm -hmm. yeah, anybody familiar? So he has a wonderful way of putting these things. Here are Earth's land mammals by weight. So every little square is a million tons of mammal on the planet. Okay? The dark ones, that's us. That's just human beings. The light gray ones, that's all our critters. Those are the cows. The, the goats, the sheep, the chickens, and everything else. Where's the wildlife? It's the little green ones. That's what's left. That really makes human appropriation of net primary production quite vivid, doesn't it? That's how much we've converted the planet over to serving our needs. All right. Now, you might imagine this has some consequences for nature. And we can just briefly summarize some of the highlights of that. If we look at vertebrates, and this isn't species, this is just critters. This is how many, how many vertebrates are left. So 58% of them have now gone. 
And in the last year, we've seen more and more studies coming out saying that that rate is accelerating very rapidly. Um, we've lost 83% of vertebrate life in freshwater rivers. In fact, most of the freshwater rivers of the world are simply now sewer pipes. Right? You know, the Mississippi River isn't a functioning ecosystem. It's just this thing that spews our agricultural waste into the Gulf of Mexico and makes it dead zone. Um, 36% of marine vertebrates gone, 38%, 22% um, uh, of birds. Right now, it's at 4% per year is the rate of decline, um, year over year. And as I say, it's accelerated. Most of this is within the last 40 years. Insect biomass is down 45%, but this figure, I think, is quite out of date. I don't know how many of you saw the uh, study that came out of Germany uh, late last year. They've been measuring biomass, insect biomass, in nature preserves in Germany for a quarter of a century. And what they found is that in not even 30 years, the biomass of insects, flying insects, in nature preserves in Germany, not agricultural areas, but in their, in their set-aside land, has declined by 75%. Um, forests. 80% of the forests that were here in 1800 are gone. Interesting little factoid. Uh, in the last decade of the 20th century, there were more forest fires than in the entirety of human history up to that point. Most of them set deliberately in order to clear agriculture. Aquifers. I've got a little asterisk there next to the 65% aquifers. Let me unpack what that means. 65% is the proportion of the planet's aquifers that are being unsustainably drawn down. Um, and I suspect now they're tired than that. I don't know when this date was. In the United States, we have two main huge aquifers. We have the Ogallala Aquifer, which stretches from North Texas up all the way into Canada, and we have the aquifer that underlies California's Central Valley, where we grow now, I think, still 90% of our, our vegetables in the store that are domestically produced. Um, the Ogallala is being drawn down so quickly that in North Texas, they pretty much had to give up taking water out of it. Um, and as it, as it continues to get drawn down, they say unless it dramatically slows the rate at which we're irrigating, 2040 will be peak agriculture in the breadbasket, and after that it will drop off very sharply. The Great Plains is where we grow all our grain, right? And the reason we grow it is because we're pulling all this water out of the Oklahoma Aquifer. California Central Valley, you may remember they had a big drought for five years. They drew so much water out, they were pulling 20,000 year old water out of that aquifer. The Central Valley has dropped on an average of two feet. They can measure it from satellites. The ground has just sunk like a sponge that you suck the water out of. It's never coming back up again. The next drought, there's not going to be any water. So, and, and you know, people talk about, well, we can do this and that for agriculture. Well, there's no replacing water. It's not like there's some sort of artificial substitute for water. Soil. Again, this figure, what does it mean? 33%. That is what the United Nations says is the proportion of the world's agricultural soils that are so badly degraded you can no longer grow food on them. Um, you really kind of have to unpack soil carefully because there's two things going on here. On the one hand, there's the dirt. Dirt is the soil. Dirt is just, you know, ground up rocks, basically. Um, clay and silt and sand. Um, the amount of dirt that can be topsoil is dramatically reduced. Uh, falling right now, they say at the current rate of loss will be about 60 years and there just won't be anymore. It's being swept away um, by mostly by erosion because of the way that we do our agriculture. But the really key thing to focus on is soil. Soil is an ecosystem. Soil is alive. And even when you look out at a field and you see, you know, all the lush green corn and the soy and everything growing, and you say, well, well, they've still got soil. No, they actually don't. They've got dirt. They've turned that soil over a couple of times a year for the last generation, and every year they take a big tractor out and they pump it full of ammonia. You ever smell ammonia? You use it to, to sterilize things, right? Why do they pump it full of ammonia? Because it's mostly nitrogen. And then when you put the plants and seeds in, the plants grow because there's a ton of nitrogen, but there's no ecosystem there. From the point of view of nature, that's a desert. There's no ecosystem at all. Right? So, yeah, soil is a living thing. And uh, it's one we rely upon. Okay. So there's a lot of talk about, okay, so it's the sixth extinction. You know, the extinction rate is a thousand times normal. Everyone has seen those headlines. A focus on the extinction rate is a little bit misleading. Uh, and there's a nice quote here that I just thought I would go ahead and share. 
Uh, this is from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences uh, a little less than a year ago. When you focus on just species, it sounds like it's a problem, but it's one we've got time to do something about. You know, maybe make some nature preserves, put some you know, endangered species lists out, stuff like that. But biodiversity is much more than just a bunch of species. Biodiversity is also about genetic diversity within a species. And that's extremely important because the Earth does change. It changes dramatically, you know. A few thousand years ago was an ice age, and a few thousand years there'll be another one, no matter what we do, uh, because there are larger forces at work. And animals have to adapt to changing climates, changing habitats. And the way that they're able to do that is because of the genetic diversity that they have within their various populations spread all over the place. This population maybe can't deal with it, but this one has some trait that allows them to. And so life goes on, and the ecosystem doesn't fall apart. But what we've done now, we've got, as it says, dwindling population sizes uh, amount to an anthropogenic erosion of biodiversity, and the ecosystem services is essentially the civilization. They call it a biological annihilation. Yeah, there's some tigers left, but not enough to survive anything that the planet can throw at it. And that's true across the board, not just with rare species, but with common species because we've chopped up the land and destroyed the habitats, and although there are animals left, there's no genetic diversity in those populations. So they're extremely fragile. Okay. Well, so what about these ecosystem services? Um, what are we talking about here? So ecosystem services, well, that's food, right, crops. Um, not just food, but the things that pollinate them, the things that create the soil. Um, in particular, to do the nutrient cycling. Something that took me a long time to understand. It's like, okay, so the body needs iron. Why can't I just suck on a nail? Why can't I get my iron that way? Well, because it's not bioavailable to you that way, right? It requires an ecosystem in the soil to make that iron available to the food that you eat so that it goes into your body and you can use it. Without that ecosystem service, the food has no nutrition in it. No nutrition in it. Um, Waste decomposition, and as I like to say, you know, shit isn't compost. Uh, it needs help becoming compost. That's, uh, that's uh, an ecosystem service. Raw materials, um, when the oil runs out, the only way we're going to get anything in the way of um, uh, resins and cellulose and so on is from plants. Um, you can't wear concrete. Think about it. That would not be comfortable. Um, pest and disease control, carbon cycling, very important. A tremendous amount of the excess carbon in the air right now is not from burning fossil fuels, a lot of it is, but a lot of it is from the carbon that used to be in the soil and used to be in those forests that are gone. Right? Um, and climate regulation and medicinal resources and all kinds of things, and that's not even counting the cultural and spiritual nourishment that nature gives to us. So, how can we quantify what those ecosystem services are worth? If you think of the entire gross global product of uh, our economy, our human economy, it's about $25 trillion. The price tag that they put on the ecosystem services that we enjoy is $33 trillion. As one philosopher put it, most of the value and sustenance in the world economy does not come from pulling things out of nature. It just comes from nature itself doing what nature does. That's where most of the value to us comes from. So when they speak of a massive erosion of the ecosystem services essential to human civilization, this is what they're talking about. Destroying our ecosystem, ecosystem isn't just ecocide, it's suicide. So I want to make four essential points about everything I've just told you. Um, first of all, <clears throat> this was already happening without climate change. I haven't mentioned climate change. I could go on for a couple of hours. Climate change, but I haven't talked about it. But all this was underway well before climate change. So let me just say one or two brief words. Um, I've got someone here from CCL, so she can back to <laughs> the, Paris, the Paris Accords uh, are supposed to limit global warming to two degrees centigrade globally, right? Um, that's kind of darkly humorous. I don't know, maybe you're not into dark humor. Um, I like dark humor, and so somebody said dark humor is like food, not everybody gets it. <laughs> yeah. So whether you find it funny or not, it is ridiculous. Why is it ridiculous? Well, it's based on three things. Um, first of all, it's based on the idea that we will rapidly transition away from the use of fossil fuels. 
Secondly, that we will have massive infrastructure projects to create what are called negative emission technologies to pull a lot of the carbon that we put into the air back out of it. And thirdly, it assumes that the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, projections of, say, 10 years ago are still valid. And all three of these things, obviously, aren't happening. First of all, we're not transitioning away from fossil fuels, certainly not in the United States, but not even anywhere else. And it's not Trump. Obama bragged about pulling as much oil out as anybody ever had before. So we're not transitioning away from use of fossil fuels. An increasing number of scientific organizations, most recently the EU Science Advisory Council, says that negative emission technology is a pipe dream. There is no way to create the infrastructure that would be required. It's not feasible to actually pull that carbon back out of the atmosphere. You can do it locally on a small scale, but it's not feasible to do it on a large scale. Not in a way that would actually affect climate change. And the IPCC projections of even as recently as 10 years ago have proven to be far too conservative, far too optimistic. We've been at the worst end of their projections every year, and it keeps getting worse. We're already one and a half degrees centigrade over pre-industrial temperatures, and quickly shooting past two degrees centigrade. In the last few months, most of the scientists are saying the new best case scenario is four and a half degrees centigrade for the century, and that's the best case, easily six degrees or worse. And we've already got an ecosystem on its knees. This is a climate change that's as extreme and as abrupt as the Permian Triassic extinction, when 75% of terrestrial vertebrates and 95% of ocean vertebrates died out. So, yeah, climate change. Here's the thing about it. Um, it's permanent. Mm -hmm. You can't fix it. When an ecosystem collapses, when the species go extinct, that's it, they're gone. The only thing that can fix nature is nature itself, and it takes a long, long time to do it. After the Triassic, Permian Triassic extinction, it took many tens of millions of years before biodiversity once again reached the point it had been before that. So this is a permanent thing. Um, it's not inevitable. It was never inevitable. A lot of people said, well, well, you know, human beings do what human beings do. There was no way to stop this. That's not true. Ecosystem collapse is the result of social and political choices, especially in the last 40 years. It was not inevitable. It did not have to happen. And you know, the worst of it can still be prevented. We still have a window of time when ecocide can be greatly mitigated. We'll talk more about how that is. Okay. So, Suppose you're a bunny in the meadow, and you look around, and you kind of see what's happening, and you do the math, and you see where things are headed. So you stand up on the highest mound in the meadow that you can find, and you say, hey, everybody, I've got something really important to tell you. Come on over here. You say, now look, we've all got to stop eating <laughs> and having babies. And I know it's crowded, but we need half of you to, you know, we need, we need all everybody to double up in their burrows so that we can set aside half the meadow so it'll be grown. What are they going to say to you if you're that body? Are you eating? Eating. <laughs> right? Not a way to become popular, right? Uh, Rebecca Solnit writes a snarky little essay about how you're, you know, a pernicious idealist and just disgruntled that the world isn't perfect, right? And Rachel Maddow has a new reason every day for her viewers as to, you know, why you're probably on Putin's payroll. <laughs> right? Not going to make you popular. So that brings up the next big question that I want to talk about. How did we get here? Such a sorry state. So, Here's the thing about history, I'm not a historian, if there's any historians in here, I apologize ahead of time. Um, Forgive you. <laughs> you know, the, the current of the present has countless tributaries, doesn't it? Right? Sure. So many tributaries. And, and you could pick any one of them to talk about how we got here. Uh, and you wouldn't be wrong. So I'm going to pick one. I'm going to pick the 14th century in the West. We won't talk about the Mongols or the Aztecs. We'll just talk about 14th century and Western city. Anybody? Want to volunteer anything interesting that happened in the 14th century? 
Uh, Black Death. So yeah, like a third of Europe died. Yeah. Right? Okay. <laughs> that was one. Uh, anything else? The monasticism. Uh, What's that? Nice record. Nice record. Yes, lots of really interesting people at that time. Right? It was right after the height of the Middle Ages. Climate changed. We right? went from the medieval warm period to the low ice age. That had a lot to do with what happened in the 14th century. What I want to focus on is what the Italians did. The Italians invented banks. Now that's a little bit too sweeping. We had banks before that. I mean, it comes from a Latin word meaning bench. The money lenders would sit out on the benches and they had an abacus scratch into the stone and they would do their thing. But the Italians really sort of invented what we think of as the modern institution of banking, where you put in your money and they loan that money out to enterprises that then pay the money back with interest and so the amount of money grows and so that goes back out, right? And that led more or less uh, inexorably to capitalism. Now, again, there was kinds of capitalism before the 14th century, and we didn't get modern capitalism instantly. But it was kind of the watershed moment, because how does that system work? You have to be careful when you talk about capitalism, because different people mean different things by it. Right? Mm -hmm. Some people say, well, capitalism, that's free enterprise. Or capitalism, that means you can sell your labor, you can hire someone to work for you, right? That's capitalism. capitalism is an economic system in which natural and human resources are exploited in order to maximize monetized value. That's what capitalism is, and you can see why the banks are the central institution in that process, because the money comes out of the bank to the enterprise, the enterprise pays more money back into the bank, which then loans it back out again. The whole system requires that the amount of monetized value be continually growing. If it doesn't, it collapses. We call that a depression. Right? Sometimes we refer to it as the business cycle. Always a crisis of consumption. And those crises of consumption began to happen very quickly in Europe in the 14th and 15th century. So that led pretty quickly to colonialism because when you haven't got something you can invest in at home, what do you do? You go find new enterprises somewhere else, and that's what they did. And so they started to carve up the world as this political cartoon, uh, probably the 18th century, uh, represents. And so. Uh, you know, you get sugar from the West Indies, and you get spice from the East Indies. You do have a new problem, and that is that people are remarkably reluctant to spend all of their time helping make you rich. <laughs> um, so they came up with various solutions to that. This is a well-known one. Um, you just put in chains and whip them if they don't, right? And of course, that got itself turned into a commodified resource, so that was a big part of capitalism, the buying and selling of slaves. Uh, and that went on for several hundred years. And then, of course, we also had industrialization. You know, for about a thousand years, most of the people in, in northern and western Europe, uh, common people, had lived in the common system. Uh, what that meant is they sort of held the land in common under the sovereignty of some aristocrat, but it was the people who worked the land. They were the ones who beat the bounds, made sure the land was cared for. And for like a thousand years, it was just fine. You know, it sustained the people. When capitalism came along, well, the land now has to make money. If it doesn't make money, then it doesn't have value in this system. So they began to enclose the commons. I'm sure you've heard about this. By the 17th and 18th century, the commons were enclosed, which meant the people no longer had their own means of providing a sustenance for themselves or anything to do. So they moved to the cities and, of course, get hired to work in the factories. Um, no way to live except by selling their labor, and that hasn't changed much. Uh, in a couple of hundred years since. For most people, that's pretty much the choice. Figure out the best way to sell your labor, because if you don't, you don't have any roof over your head, and you don't have any food in your mouth, and you can't care for your kids, and so on and so forth. So that's uh, the contemporary solution uh, to the old problem of getting people to contribute to someone else's profit. Uh, of course, the other thing that we saw pretty quickly was resource exhaustion. Can anybody tell me what we're looking at? Resources. Oyster shells. Bison skulls. No, those are bison skulls. Those are bison skulls. There were tens of millions of American bison in the Great Plains where we now grow corn. And over the course of a very few decades in the 19th century, they were hunted down to just a few hundred. Why? Well, there were three main reasons. The primary reason was, well, it made money. Those skins were extremely valuable, especially overseas. So we shipped millions and millions of bison skins to Europe and elsewhere. 
Um, because it was the 19th century and these are two-ton animals, they couldn't exactly harvest the meat. So what they would do is that, because of the way the bison behave, it's pretty interesting. If you shoot one, the others all gather around and see what's going on. So then you can shoot a hundred. And so that's what they did. They would shoot them by the hundred per day. And then they would go out and the skinners would skin them and they would leave the carcasses rotting in the sun. And when all the meat had rotted away, they would come back and they would gather up the bones. For guess what? Fertilizer. Fertilizer is a critically important commodity. Yeah. I mean, the U.S. Navy was made finding that one, you know, around the world to bring home again. Fertilizer is a critically important commodity. So that was the second reason. And the third reason some of you will have heard about is that this was also the time of the Anger Indian Genocide. And they needed to find ways of forcing Indians off the land. And one way was to remove their food source. Was to what? Remove their food source. So lots of reasons. So. You look at this and you, you kind of shake your head because, you know, first of all, it tremendously degraded the Great Plains ecosystem, probably contributed enormously to the, uh, the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. Um, you know, the, the bison were a critical part of that ecosystem, and that ecosystem was basically destroyed. Now we pump the money into it to grow corn. Uh, but it, it, you know, why wouldn't they be smart and, and harvest the, the bison sustainably? They could have done that. And then they'd still be selling skins today, 150 years later. Right? Why didn't they do that? Well, capitalism doesn't have built into its structure any concern for the far future. Capitalism is predicated on the notion that we have to put a bigger number on this quarter's bottom line than we put on that bottom line last quarter. Because if we don't, the system breaks. It has to function that way. It doesn't have any choice. People often compare capitalism to cancer because the only value built into it is the value of growth. I think the more interesting comparison is this. Neither cancer nor capitalism has any intrinsic way of valuing the survival of the host, which is why the host usually dies. All right, well, you know, people did fight back. Uh, at the end of the 19th century, um, there were lots of things people did. Uh, labor got organized and started to insist that the owners uh, make things a little more equal, that the, the, the labor got some larger piece of, of the profit that was being made. Um, there were a lot of progressive reforms. They got the kids out of the factories and into the schools. Eventually we had five-day work week and other kinds of reforms. Um, marginal tax rates came along. Um, it was the progressive era, right? Women's suffrage and all kinds of good things happened. And there were laws to protect uh, eventually the environment and the vulnerable, and finally with the New Deal, we got Social Security and other things to help people when they're old. Um, people fought back, so did capital. Capital also fought back. And it fought back very fiercely. And I want to briefly talk about some of the important ways that it did so. It did so through propaganda, through a war economy and state sponsorship of primary industry, through a state of permanent war, through criminalization, of everyday life, and very importantly, through commodification of our culture. So let me take each of these just briefly in turn. Start with propaganda. Now, I tell people propaganda started at the beginning of the 20th century, and they say, well, what about the pamphleteers and all that? Well, sure, persuading people and, and publishing stuff and getting people to believe a certain thing, that's as old as dirt. But propaganda, so-called, properly understood, is actually a modern invention. It really goes back to a guy named Edward Bernays, who was Sigmund Freud's nephew. He's the one who coined the terms propaganda, public relations, and interestingly, psychological warfare. What he came up with were a body of techniques to apply the methods of psychological manipulation that the Freudians had discovered and use them through mass media to do mass manipulation of people. And he had a lot of really interesting uh, success is very early on. It's an interesting point that in 1910, women didn't smoke in public. It was taboo. It was like going to a restaurant in your swimsuit. I mean, you just didn't do it. They kicked you out, right? By 1920, that had completely changed. Women were lighting up like crazy, smoking the cancer sticks right along with the men, which made, of course, the tobacco companies very, very happy. How did that happen? Well, they hired Edward Bernays to come up with a program to get women to smoke, and it worked. It used mass media and psychological manipulation, and it worked. And if you want to know the details, there's a fantastic documentary, 2002, Adam Curtis on the BBC. It's called The Century of the Self. 
and uh, it's four hours, and it goes into great detail about how this was all done. Very, very interesting. Lots of other noted successes. You know, after World War II, uh, the Global South discovered that it had the freedom to actually govern itself in many ways that it hadn't been able to for centuries because of colonialism. That especially happened in Latin America, and unfortunately, though, in places like Guatemala and Honduras, where they got this crazy notion that their country belonged to them, United Fruit and others had other plans, and uh, Bernays was a big part of convincing Americans that, for example, the president of Guatemala was a communist, so it was okay to be this way. That was repeated all over the place, Chile, et cetera, Iran, all kinds of places. Um, the techniques were copied by Joseph Goebbels, <coughs> to uh, make people dedicated to the Third Reich, um, and it's now universally employed by public relations businesses and governments. So here's a fun question. How many of you would say that your worldview is strongly influenced by propaganda? Show hands. I'm sure all of you are. <laughs> so one of my favorite writers is uh, G.K. Chesterton. And he wrote that the essence of every picture is the frame. And I remember when I read that the first time, I thought, well, that's stupid. I mean, surely the essence of the picture is something to do with what's in the picture, right? But he was, as usual, he was right on the money because what does the frame do? It's precisely what decides what's in the picture. The essence of every picture is the frame. So let me share with you the primary technique of modern propaganda, which is framing. So here's a picture from the first Iraq War. Um, how would you characterize the emotional content Pretty negative. I mean, here you've got a prisoner of war. He's obviously in distress. He's being roughly handled. The American soldier's got a gun to his forehead. This is a pretty negative picture, right? You don't want this out there to, to propagandize for the war effort. How about this picture? The emotional content of this picture is very different, isn't it? Right? This is very positive. Here, this, this nice American soldier is helping this poor Iraqi prisoner of war. He's holding him up. He's giving him water. He's going to, you know, make him okay again. Completely different picture, except it isn't. It's exactly the same picture. The only thing that changed was the frame. That's all that changed was the frame. Now, who frames the world for you? Well, this picture is out of date. It used to be six major corporations. Now it's only five because Viacom and CBS are largely owned by the same organization. These highly interconnected media companies control 90% of what every American sees and reads. Things do change, so now we have two other really big giants in the media world. One of them, of course, is Google. And Google is deeply intertwined with our government at this point, especially the security state. Um, and Amazon, right, which is now a media company, among all the other things that it is. We'll talk more about Amazon in a minute. So uh, these are the companies that uh, now provide Americans with their frame on the world, and not just their news, but their entertainment, their music, their magazines, everything, 90%. The, the CEO of CBS boasted at one point that he envisioned a world where a person got everything from CBS from the time they get up in the morning to the time they went to bed at night. But that was the channel. They're the channel, right? The problem here isn't just propaganda. The problem is also culture. Because the habitat of culture, I'm going to quote here an English uh, philosopher by the name of David Lean, the habitat of culture is community. That's where culture comes from. It comes from community. So, you know, music and style and shared, uh, shared narratives and outlook on the world and um, artistry, all the arts. These are the things that connect your humanity to the humanity of other people. That's what culture does. And that's why its habitat is community. Commercial culture is not a product of community. Commercial culture is a product of applied psychology and public relations. It's no more the product of community than the GMO wheat in your bread is a product of an ecosystem. Actual culture is generative. It produces a human experience and a human future. But commercial culture is derivative. Its purpose is control through framing. This really came home to me when I was overseas. Uh, I went to see, at that time, a uh, big movie came out, um, The Hunt for Red October, Denzel Washington, and remember that? 
And I went to see it with a couple of friends from Australia. Uh, and it came out of the movie, and I was all pumped up, you know, it was very exciting and all this. I thought, wow, that was a really great movie. And they so totally punctured my bubble. They just thought, that's the most jingoistic thing I've ever seen in my life. Because they saw the frame. I didn't see the frame. I didn't notice that it's the Russians who are always unpredictable and crazy, and it's the terrorists who are always the bad guys, and that the Americans have the job of keeping the world safe for everyone. And that our motives, even when we make mistakes, always come from a place of beauty. Right? That's the frame in all of our entertainment, and I didn't see it at all, but they saw it. I'm not subjected to it day after day after day. So, you know, 115 million people watched the Super Bowl. How many ever saw the frame? Almost none. Okay. Speaking of the military, I said that uh, the war economy, state capitalism, mm. this is uh, Trump's uh, requested budget. He mm. won't get it, but he'll get something very close to it. Mm -hmm. Now, how do I know that? Sure. Because it'll look exactly like the same budget we've had for 40 years. Half the money goes to the military. Now, this is the discretionary budget. Naysayers will say, well, now look, if you look at the whole federal budget, you know, that's really a much smaller piece. But they're adding in Social Security and Medicaid and so on. Those things are paid for by their own taxes. Take those away, the taxes go away too. So this is really what we need to talk about in terms of where we decide to spend money. And we spend it in that big blue piece that says military. And really, you know, that's misleading too, because it's not like it's going to the soldiers. It's not even going to the bullets they fire. It's going to a large number of highly favored corporations, Amen. Boeing, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, General Dynamics, and so on and so forth. And hundreds of corporations who supply those corporations. This is state capitalism. It's not free market capitalism. It's a capitalism in which the state determines which businesses will get taken care of. Notice that that pie chart never changes. It doesn't matter whether you've got a Democrat or a Republican on office, right? If you really want to be convinced, um, this is a couple years old now, 600 billion defense budget, more than the next 12 countries combined. Now, it might make sense if those were 12 enemies that we were at war with, but they're not. Most of them are allies. The only two that aren't aren't really enemies. We call them strategic rivals, right? But they're not enemies. So what's that money being spent for? It's not to protect you and me. It's being spent for some other purpose entirely. Okay. Criminalization of everyday life. Um, kind of move things along a little more quickly here. Um, this is a quote many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with. John Ehrlichman explaining how the drug war happened under, under President Nixon had nothing to do with drugs, it had everything to do with liberal hippies and black power activists getting up the Nixon administration's nose and they wanted to do something about it, and going after drugs was the way they could do it. Now, this quote is disputed. We don't know because John Ehrlichman's dead. The, the journalist says it's real and other people say, well, we never have said that. But we know that it's historically accurate. In fact, you can go back to the 1930s when the drug war really began, You'll see on this graph, 1930s is when we really started incarcerating people for drugs in order to criminalize, and this is in the written record, criminalize Hispanic life and black life. That's the point of making marijuana illegal. Um, and it rapidly accelerated in the 70s and 80s, dramatically accelerated through the Reagan years and then the Clinton years. You know, it's interesting. How many laws are there that you can go to jail for if you break them? If you start thinking about it, people, okay, so there's all the law, you know, the, the crimes against a person, it's like that's 16 kinds of murder and assault, and then there's burglaries and there's fraud, and there's all those things. You start thinking, how many laws should there be that you know, can send you to jail? You think, well, maybe a few hundred, maybe a couple thousand at most. There are 300,000 laws you can go to jail for if you break them, and that's just federal laws. That doesn't include all the state laws and local laws. So prosecutors have huge discretion. And as the journalist Gwen Greenwald made clear in a book he published about four or five years ago, we now have two completely different legal systems. The one for the privileged, which is essentially Amen. no legal system at all, the one for you and me, where we can be sent to jail because that's what they decide they want to do. Let's finish this off, permanent war. You know, they really had the perfect war from 1948 on, the Cold War. The Cold War was the perfect war because it gave you all the spending and none of the oops, they blew up our factories, that's going on, right? And then in, 19, in 1990, the Soviets were like, we don't want to do that anymore. And that was, that was panic time in the halls of power, because what are we going to do? So, you know, right away they turned our old friend Noriega um, into an enemy, so we could you know, do something over there. 
And then they took their old friend, Saddam Hussein, and turned him into an enemy so he could go do something over there. And then they came up with a plan. It's called the Project for a New American Century. You've probably heard of it. You know, we'll take care of Iraq, and we'll get Iran, and we'll get Libya, and we'll get Syria, and we'll, you know, all this will go on. And of course, we're still in Afghanistan. War on terror helped. It, it makes it possible now for us to basically be carrying on more anywhere in the world we feel like. Uh, and constant war is very important because it gives you uh, a very powerful form of domestic propaganda. If you criticize the government in wartime, you're sort of like an enemy, aren't you? Um, it justifies a huge defense budget. And it's really kind of a global protection market. And they're trying very, very hard to bring that Cold War back. I don't know if you've noticed. So who won? The people or the capitalists? If you go back to the Gilded Age in the 19th century, right? which is often held up as being the archetypal, this is when we had horrible inequality, you know, the Carnegies, the Rockefellers, the steel barons, the railroad barons, the, all these huge huddled masses, um, you know, struggling in poverty. This was the bad time. It was the time in response to which all those progressive reforms were ultimately made, right? The labor laws and so on and so forth. So how was it in the Gilded Age? Well, the top 10% uh, in terms of wealth, owned about three-fourths of the financial wealth of the country. The top 2% owned uh, a third. That was in the Gilded Age. How is it today? Well, the top 10% own about three-fourths of the country. The top 1% own 40% of the country. Some interesting factoids here. Um, there are eight people, six of whom are American who own as much as, guess what? Half, half. Half of humanity. Half of humanity. Jeff Bezos, who's now he's the Amazon CEO, he's now the uh, richest man in the world, um, he makes $128,000 a minute. So to, to put that into perspective, you know, I have a, people would say, it, it's a pretty good job, it doesn't pay a lot, but I mean, you gotta have a PhD to do it, and it's pretty decent working conditions and so on. Um, Jeff Bezos is going to make more while I'm talking to you here tonight than I could make in 10 lifetimes as a math professor. That's how extreme the wealth inequality is now. The global 1%, according to Oxfam, this just came out last month, the global 1% took 82% of the wealth that was created last year. Everybody else gets to share what's left. And most of this has happened comparatively recently. This huge disparity in wealth has exploded over the course of the last generation. Uh, again, it's nice to have a really vivid picture. So this is from a video, which if you haven't seen it, I strongly recommend you to look at it. You can find it on YouTube very, very easily. There's wealth inequality in America. Um, and it goes through what the actual wealth distribution is. And this is just one frame from it near the end. And what it is, he took the American population, divided it up into 100 people, you know, a representative of the whole population. Here's how much money each of them has. And as you can see, that 1% over there, he's got almost as much as everybody else combined. He's got way more than the bottom 80% does, right? And here's something now that I want you to think about. That guy over there with his own stack, right? He's not a Republican. And he's also not a Democrat. What is he? He's an owner. He is one of the owners of society. Think about the political issues that you're passionate about, that you argue with people about on Facebook or social media, that you go out to marches for. So, so you know, a woman's right to choose gun control, racial justice, family values. You know, if you're on the other side of the political spectrum from those. Um, you know, who, which party runs Congress, uh, Women's March, all that stuff. You don't think about any of that. He doesn't care about any of that. Those things are as far removed from his day-to-day -day concerns as the worries of your neighbor's dog are to you. Partisan politics has no impact on his position as one of the owners of society. He decides in the course of the country, and to a great extent, he decides what you're going to think about it. In 2014, they did a study at Princeton. They wanted to know if you look at all the laws that have been passed that you know are policy, how the country gets run, and compare them to opinion polling, what does it look like? Well, 
for most of us, you know, the bottom 99%, if 10% of us are strongly opposed to a policy change, that policy change has about a 30% chance of passing anyway. Whereas if 90% of us are in favor of a policy change, that policy change has about a 30% chance of passing. In other words, what you and I think has no bearing on what the government actually does. But look at the one percenter. If 10% of the one percenters are opposed to it, it's not going to happen. I mean, if 10% of them are in favor of it, if 90% are opposed to it, it's not going to happen. On the other hand, if 10% are opposed and 90% are in favor, you can make a lot of money betting it's going to pass. That's a regular thing. So, what does this say about democracy in the United States? And where does that leave all of us? I mean, look at us. We've lost everything. We've lost our ecosystem. We've lost our culture. We've lost our democracy. We've lost our wealth. And we've lost our future. And Americans may not know what's going on, but they sense that things are getting very dark. Very dark. And so we're starting to see all the social pathologies of collapse. In the first 23 days of this year, there were 11 mass school shootings. In the first 23 days of the year. That doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. Even in places where people walk around with guns all day, that doesn't happen. We have an opioid epidemic. Almost 5% of our adult population misuses opioids. 2 million are addicted. 40,000 die every year. And I'm not including the illegal ones like heroin. That's just opioids they get from their doctor. Lots of suicide that way. Soaring suicide rate, especially among the middle-aged. 25% is how much the uh, overall suicide rate has increased. And for middle-aged men, it's increased 50% since the beginning of the century. This is the only nation in the world where we sit around and watch each other die from treatable illnesses for lack of medical care. The only developed democracy where that happens. You know, we've only got 5% of the world's population. We've got 22% of its prisoners. We lock ourselves up. Obesity rate, China and India both have four times as many people as the United States. Neither one of them has as many people who are more than obese. 80% of our population has suffered a serious personal financial crisis at least once in their life, unemployment, homelessness, and so on. About half of our population is just flirting with poperty. 60% 60, 60 of gun deaths are suicide. Average household debt is $140,000. That's $1.4 trillion in student debt. All of that debt, household debt, apart from mortgages, the, all the credit card debt, the consumer debt, the student debt, none of that can any longer be discharged by bankruptcy. It's a life sentence. Yeah, you ever see that movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? You know how the, the characters, they were escaped convicts, right? And every time they were about to get caught, the George Clooney character, he'd say what? He'd say, damn, I'm in a tight spot. And I was like that. And it reminded me of my grandfather, I'm in a tight spot. And it raises a very important question. Which part of the story did we come in on? Is this the end of the human story? So having persuaded you maybe that it's a little bit hopeless, I now have a harder task. I need to persuade you that it isn't. So it doesn't have to be a Shakespearean tragedy. What can we do? We could reclaim constitutional democracy. That's actually possible to do. In theory, it's possible. I mean, all the mechanisms of our democratic institutions are still in place. People can go to the polls. They can vote. <coughs> It's possible to reclaim that democracy. We could, to a very large extent, we could restore the environment, especially through regenerative agriculture. The UNFAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, says if you do small-scale, localized, organic, regenerative agriculture, we can produce more food, and we can restore the health of the soil, and we can restore biodiversity to the environment. It's possible. You can do it. We could reduce our population, and it doesn't require any authoritarian measures to do so because we already know how it works. We've seen it all over the place. Make sure that women have complete control over their own reproductive choices, and make sure that nobody has to rely upon children for their financial security now or in their old age. And they'll stop having kids. It happens naturally. It works. 
we could reduce our consumption. You know, in that picture of the overshoot, um, it said we were using 1.7 Earths. In the United States, we use like, somewhere between five and seven Earths, if everyone consumes the way we do. We could reduce our consumption. That's something we're capable of doing without sacrificing quality of life, just not consume as much. We could return dignity and culture to our communities. In short, we could create a just, prosperous, and sustainable future. This is actually possible to do. But the solutions are all going to have two things in common. First, they're going to be radical solutions. Radical is a nice word. It means go to the root. Right? They're going to be solutions that fundamentally change the way things work. And the other thing is, they're going to be political solutions. It's not enough to change your lifestyle. It's not enough to be the change. That's important. You do have to change. We all have to change. But that's not going to do it. There have to be actual, real political changes. We have to change the political reality, the political material reality. Okay. So, how? Well, the political foundations of any possible human future are going to have to include certain elements. There's going to have to be ecological wisdom. Ecological wisdom begins with the recognition that we are not on Earth, but part of it. Part of the planet. Its life is our life, and every wound we inflict on it is a wound through which our own life's blood will pass away. So there has to be ecological wisdom, regardless of what the other bodies say. Grassroots democracy. This is often misunderstood. People think of it as direct democracy. Everybody voting for everything. Grassroots democracy simply means that political authority doesn't flow down through our political institutions. It flows up through our political institutions so that the people express their political authority through those institutions rather than the privileged and the wealthy expressing their authority. Social justice. This is often a phrase that is much ridiculed, especially on the right. You know, people think it means redistribution of wealth. That's social justice. Social justice is actually a very simple thing. It's a recognition that unless human beings have the means and the opportunity to thrive, then there is no human future. That's a correct. And nonviolence. Now, I haven't said much about violence, but it should be fairly obvious that violence courses through this whole conversation, this whole discussion. It flows through the whole story. Violence to nature, violence to communities, violence to people's lives. And we should remember, especially now, every day, that over every breath we take, like the sword of Damocles, hangs the threat of nuclear annihilation. So, I probably don't have to convince you that this isn't the country of the Republican Party. <laughs> One or two people might be made a little bit uncomfortable when I say it's not going to come from the Democratic Party. Um, Nancy Pelosi was, uh, was uh, on CNN the other night. And in an unscripted moment, she actually said what everyone knows, um, we're capitalists, get used to it. This is the way it is. So honestly, you know, there's no scenario by which the Democratic Party becomes the Progressive Party. There was an opportunity, historically there was an opportunity, um, when FDR got elected for the last time, his vice president was Henry Wallace, very progressive. Um, and the business leaders in the Democratic Party got together and they basically wrested control of the Democratic Party from the ailing FDR, and they got rid of Henry Wallace and they put in Harry Truman. And the result was that we didn't get FDR's Economic Bill of Rights, Instead, we got the military industrial complex. And the rest is history. So it can't be reformed within because it's not a democratic institution, not in any sense. It's not even a meritocracy in any sense. You know, the primaries where you elect the leaders and so on, that's pretty much theater for the rank and file. We know that now, and some of us have, have thought it for a long time, but in 2016, WikiLeaks like revealed all the inner workings for us, right? So we can actually see it going on, what they do. And people got very upset, they sued them. And the Democratic Party went to the judge and they said, look, we're a private club. We don't have to be democratic. We don't even have to follow our own rules. We can do whatever the hell we want. And what did the judge say? That's the law. That is the law. So it's kind of like this, you know, the duopoly. Uh, so there's two buses. You should imagine this. There's two buses. 
One is being driven by a crazed reactionary and he's swerving all over the road. He doesn't give a damn about the passengers, whether they starve, whether they're sick. The other bus is being driven um, by a shrewd, pragmatic realist with a very steady hand and who treats the passengers marginally better. <laughs> so which bus would you rather be on? Now, but wait a minute before you answer, because there's one other very important fact you need to know. Both buses are driving straight toward a cliff and are shortly going to go over, killing everybody aboard. Now, which bus do you want to be on? Neither. The crazy one. So the Republicans. <laughs> the Republicans didn't put the country in its current condition, and the Democrats didn't put the country in its current condition. The owners did it. And they did it knowingly, and they did it on purpose. And they're still doing it, and they're still doing it on purpose. The duopoly parties, that's just two brands mm -hmm. of the same machine. And they're just as joined at the hip, like Fox and MSNBC. They look really different. But go to the boardroom, you'll see a lot of the same faces. By design, they serve the owner's agenda. They will never serve yours. And the fire sign theater said it really well almost 50 years ago now. They said, we're all bozos on this bus. The only rational choice is to get off the damn bus right now. You know, when you get off the bus, that has profound consequences. One very important effect is that it frees you to build your own frame on the world. People don't have that freedom right now. In fact, it can be quite intimidating. I get the sense that sometimes people don't want to leave the duopoly parties because they rely upon those parties to provide a narrative that makes sense of what's going on, because it's all very scary. But getting off the bus allows you to start to build your own frame, and it has an even more important effect, and that's the effect it has on establishment power. There's a reason they spend billions and billions and billions of dollars on propaganda to keep you coming back to the machine, playing the part of the game, controlled opposition. They need your cooperation. They're terrified of the people for good reason. Because if enough people build an alternative political narrative, their power will vanish very, very quickly and very decisively. It's actually a very vulnerable position for them. So when you get off the bus, when you say no to the game of controlled opposition, then, and only then, does political change actually become possible. Possible, not automatic. Because the other necessity is that we actually adopt an alternative narrative and act to realize it. That requires political organization. It requires a dedication to solidarity in achieving those changes. It means not being any longer a political consumer, but becoming a political actor. We all know a lot of social media warriors, right? In fact, <laughs> but if that's all you do, you're spitting the wind. Unless you are showing up at the meetings, standing on the corner with a ballot access petition, making the contribution, stepping up to be a leader, recruiting candidates. If you're not doing those things, you're not making it happen. So in view of the realities that I've reviewed for, uh, with you here this evening, it's pretty urgent we dedicate ourselves to a politics of ecological wisdom, grassroots democracy, social justice, and an end to violence. Now, there's a lot of political parties. There's not just Democrats and Republicans, right? There's libertarians, there's several flavors of socialists, there's the modern Whigs. <laughs> Google it. I said before, I had up on the screen, there's only one party that's dedicated to these principles, and there's no point being coy about it, right? It's the Green Party. Um, it's the only one that says, okay, we see where we are, we see what's happening, and we're willing to say we've got to do something about it, and it's got to be based on these principles. There is no other political party, certainly none with national reach, that comes close to recognizing the situation. How do you get into the Green Party? Well, the Green Party is a local party, so if you live here, you join the New River Valley Greens, or if you're a student, you join the Greens at Virginia Tech. Right? Right. It's, a green, it's a local party no matter where you live, right? So you've got the Lynchburg Greens and the Richmond Greens and the Charlottesville area Greens, and those all together constitute what's called the Green Party of Virginia. It's a grassroots party, right? So it's built of what comes from below. And the Green Party of Virginia, together with 50 other, 49 other state parties, constitutes the Green Party of the United States. It's often disorienting for people who first become active Greens. You know, they keep expecting somebody to be handing down orders from above, like they do in the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. It never happens. It's spooky. It's like, who knows what's going on? 
Well, the orders don't come from above. They come from the law. You decide what's going on, right? And you do it. And it doesn't stop with the Green Party of the United States because the Green Party isn't just an American party anymore that it's a Virginia party, right? The four pillars of ecological wisdom and grassroots democracy and nonviolence, social justice, those are recognized around the globe. And with 90 other national Green parties, it constitutes the Global Greens. A worldwide political movement dedicated to a truly human future, one in balance with a living and thriving world. A movement with elected representatives in many national parliaments, with national leaders like the new Prime Minister of Iceland, for example, and with lots of local leaders like my wife on the county school board. So, when you think about our meadow, I have a picture of it. It's pretty, isn't it? When you think about our meadow, I want you to think about that question we started with. Who are the most dangerous people in the world? Surely it's the people with the power to decide whether this is our final chapter. No more change course than they can fly to the moon. They are what they are and they are who they are. They can't even think the thoughts that would allow them to change what's happening. The only people who can change it are the people with the power to take that away from them. That's the paradox of power. And so the answer to who's the most dangerous people is, well, they're here in this room. See the blue seats? Because they're the ones who will decide whether this is the final chapter or just the start of the next chapter. So anyway, that's all I have. Thank you. So this isn't a, a view that I'm particularly persuaded of, but I feel like uh, this would be a good forum to just address that. Uh -huh. um, there are people uh, who look to the future and they say, well, technology will just fix it. Look, we might not have carbon capture technology now, but we'll get there. And uh, don't worry, nuclear fusion somehow is going to come in 15 <laughs> years. Um, and robots will fix it, and we'll get mechanical oh, bees. No. So how does the green I get that, you know, I, I grew up watching Star Trek. Right? <laughs> and, and the idea that we'll just come up with a technological fix is very appealing. Um, the people who actually know technology, the scientists, they don't see that happening. And, uh, you know, it's a very comforting thought. Well, we'll just come up with some technological fix. You know, when push comes to shove, when we're back against the wall, We'll think something up. But here's the thing, it's going to be a dead world. And if the world is dead, we're going to be dead too. There's no technological fix for ecological collapse. It can't happen. So we need to prevent it. We can't cure it afterwards. We've got to prevent it. Yeah. Yeah, on the list of issues that you mentioned, one was public education, but we yeah. didn't really discuss it. And yeah, I kind of, I slipped past it in the interest of time. What I was going to say, um, I'm an educator, and uh, some other people in the room, and... Yeah, it's like the school. Yeah, it, it's clear that over the course of my professional life, the level of preparation for the majority of our students has dramatically declined. Students get to us now in a much worse condition than they did, say, in 1980. Um, they can't read with comprehension, they can't write with any kind of clarity. Uh, I'm a mathematician, they can't do uh, middle school math, eighth grade math. They can't and this is all economic led, all parts of the lab. That's right. And so, uh, what has caused the educational system to collapse? I could go on about that, but fundamentally, it's it's one of the symptoms of uh, our social pathology. Right? What do we value? We value those things that make profits, and public education doesn't make enough profit for people. That's why they're trying to kill it. Um, and one of the ways you kill it is you, you kill the profession. The owners. The owners? Yeah. Oh, we're the owners. No. 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 We don't own so much. The you owners say the 1% you own our public education. Mm -hmm. 
where do you um, intersect with them on this? I'm not sure. Owning of the book companies or the, I mean, we elect our people to the school board and they, you know, they appoint. They're, they're under the narrative. Pardon? They're all part of the narrative. Yeah, so, so pro pro propaganda is very effective. Propaganda works, right? And so you get people on school boards um, who are quite comfortable with the idea that um, when children misbehave, it's their fault and they should go to prison. Ultimately, the, the what's called the school prison pipeline. One of the things Wendy found out, and she can speak to this more than I can, but when she was on the school board, she found out one of her biggest jobs was to be advocate for students. Because the other members of the school board, with one exception, somebody misbehaves, they're ready to put them in jail. Okay? And that's, that represents a set of cultural values that, I mean, would be unrecognizable even 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, so, but where does that come from? Well, people's world is framed by the owners through their media, as we thought the it works. So the budgets also reflect political reality. That's right. That's right. And then the schools are short of the money. Right? Thank you. Go ahead. Um, I like that you define social justice for us because that, I think, is one of the rhetorical tricks Republicans like to use is say that nobody can actually define social justice. Mm -hmm. It's just a vague catch-all term for anything right. that a liberal happens to like at the moment. Mm -hmm. Or they'll say it's just a euphemism for socialism. I was wondering if you could expand on where your definition of social justice comes from. What are the key documents behind this? And what do you think uh, is the way to counter this? So one of the things that I, that I slipped over rather quickly um, if I can get back to it here, let me just kind of cheat a little bit and go in here. Uh, talk about the pathologies of our social collapse. Um, I didn't talk about the nomadic retirees and living without dignity. Um, this is a, a big thing in our world right now that a lot of people aren't quite aware of. They know about the suicides. What they don't know is the tremendous number of people of retirement age, or not even yet of retirement age, but without work are living in their cars or are living in recreational vehicles, and they're nomads. They travel from one place in the country to another, sometimes staying with relatives, but mostly chasing work. So in the summer, they might be carnies. Um, in the winter, they might go pack for Amazon, uh, or they might follow agricultural work. There's an army of these people, and I know about them because uh, I go to the only Catholic church in Appomattox County, and there's a big, uh, uh, RV place there where people hook up and live for like weeks while they're in this area doing work here before they move on someplace else and they come to work church and I get to meet them. Most of the ones I meet are doing reasonably well because they've got RVs. They're not sleeping out of their car, but a lot of people are. This is um, a really interesting example of our social pathology of collapse because even in desperately poor countries in the third world and in the global south, old people are cared for. We don't. We just cut them loose. And uh, so social justice begins with, you know, something that most of the rest of the world seems to get, which is that if people aren't cared for, if people aren't given the opportunity to be secure in just living, then where are we? It, everything falls apart. It's, it becomes a cultural, cultural and a social pathological condition. Um, now, it's true Republicans like to say, well, it's just, uh, you know, it's dog whistling for socialism. Mm -hmm. um, and the <coughs> Green Party having actually come out and explicitly said, we oppose capitalism uh, in 2016, um, has got people saying, oh, well, we must be socialists then. And a lot of Greens are socialists, um, just, you know, Marxists. Um, but the Green Party itself is not. A socialist party. Uh, it's not a Marxist party. And when you talk about socialism, it's very much like capitalism. What do you mean by it? Everyone's got their own definition. Right? Most people aren't talking about Das Kapital and Marxist analysis of capitalism. They're talking about something else that came afterwards, right? Like, so if, if you're against it, you're, you're, you're equating it with, with communism. That's your equivocation. If you're in favor of it, you, you, know, you sort, of, sort of smooth over the historical problems that that philosophy has had. But the fundamental principle of socialism, which is that 
people who are engaged in a productive enterprise should be vested with ownership in that enterprise is a pretty sound principle. And the Green Party talks about eco-socialism, which goes further than that. It says not only should the people who are engaged in a productive enterprise be vested with ownership in that enterprise, but all the people who are affected by the enterprise should also be vested with stakeholder positions in that enterprise. That's eco-socialism. But it leaves unanswered a wide, range, a wide array of questions. For example, the monetary system. Who prints money with what authority and for what purpose? <laughs> right now we have a private central bank that loans money into existence in order to drive the capitalist engine largely independently of democratic control. There are lots of theories about what it should be replaced with. That it needs to be replaced with something is pretty much not controversial. But that's an answer that socialism doesn't have. Socialism was, when it came along, was a 19th century answer to an industrializing world with oppressed workers. It didn't face a 21st century world with ecological and social collapse. So our solutions have to take account of those realities. Um, and social justice seems to me to be just a fundamental principle that says, if we're going to talk about a human future, then the center of our concern has to be human beings. And the idea that you just cut loose the ones that are useless is the first idea that's got to go. Right? We've got to show Ayn Rand the door. Right? She's not welcome. Um, and nor is anyone else who's Darwinian about human society, because we're not a Darwinian species. Right? We're, we're a caring species. That's it. Does that get close to what you're... Yeah, that works for me.